Well, good morning, Christ Walk. How's everybody today? Happy Mother's Day to all the mamas that are here with us. So glad to see you. So excited to be able to celebrate along with you. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity um, to just celebrate my wife and the mother of my children who just walked in um, right on cue. Um, you like, yeah, let's give it up. You do so much, not just for our family, but for our church, so much that goes unseen and often overlooked. And I just want to celebrate you today and just thank you for everything that you do to keep me and Luke and Avery and Millie straight, um, which is a full-time job in itself, but then you work a full-time job and then you're here and, you know, in the, in the off times and, and, and serving and loving and cr- helping to create experiences for our church and our people Um, to be able to enjoy and to be able to encounter God. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, I love this journey that we're on, and I wouldn't want to do it with anybody else. So thank you. I love you. (laughs) And um, speaking of of moms, just to let everybody know, I'll give um, a little bit more specific detail um, at the close of service, but we have something special that is going to be taking place outside that we don't want any of you to miss. So at the close of service, um, don't don't run off to your car. Um, Just quickly, let's let's play and hang around for a few minutes because I promise this is going to be something that that you want to be a part of um, and for us to celebrate together. So be looking forward to that. I'll give more details at the end of um, at the end of the service today. If you got your Bible or you got a smart device, um, why don't you turn with me or swipe with me to uh, today? We're going to be in the New Testament. Towards the end of the New Testament, we're going to take a look at um, Peter, one of the twelve disciples. He wrote a couple letters um, that were included in the New Testament canon, and we're going to be in um, the first one of those letters in First Peter chapter two. And we're going to land there together in just a moment. So you can go ahead and turn there and prepare um, for us to read together momentarily. Uh, I can remember as a kid that um, I went through a phase, a season, um, uh, just a period of time where uh, I tried my hand at collecting baseball cards and, and even basketball cards. I had several friends um, who I spent time with regularly and, and um, even like with, with their, their dads, their families and everything, that they were really into um, this hobby of collecting these cards. And so I, I thought that, that it would be something that, that I would want to do as well. And so I would scrape together any, you know, spare allowance money or whatever that I could. And every time we went to like Kmart or you know, back when Kmart was a thing when I was a kid, um, or, or, you know, like the, the drugstore or something like that, I would, I would look for, you know, those wax or foil packs of Tops or Donruss or Fleer or my favorite Upper Deck. Those are my favorite, um, you know, that had the little stack of baseball or basketball cards in it and quite possibly the worst stick of chewing gum known to like, what were, what in the world? That was awful. Like, it was just absolutely terrible. And I can remember as a kid, after amassing um, a shoebox full of these cards, you know, just all over the place in an old, like, Nike shoebox um, that I had, like, under my bed and everything. And I would pull them out and, and thumb through them and look through them and everything. And then I discovered Beckett Magazine. Anybody remember Beckett Magazine? A couple people. Beckett Magazine was um, this magazine for nerds. Um, <laughs> That it, it was just pages and pages and pages of like a card and, um, you know, like the number and the name of the person and the position that they played, like the specific details of individual cards. And it told you the approximate value of that card. And I can remember getting my hands on my very first Beckett magazine and laying all of my cards out, that whole shoebox full, and going through card by card, piece by piece, bit by bit, only to discover that I had amassed an incredible fortune that was worth approximately $12.48. But yet some of my friends, though, and, and, and their dads, they, they, had, they had some cards that were, at the time, were, were quite rare um, that, were, that were pretty valuable. And I noticed that there was something different about those cards 
um, from, from the cards that I had. Not only were they worth more money, but my cards were just strewn about in an old Nike shoebox, you know, and you would shake it and they'd get all jumbled around. And, and some of them, the, 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 the corners were dog-eared and the edges were worn and everything. But when I would go over to my friend's house and, and those special cards, there, there was, there was this, the, the, the card that hit the status where it was in like a, like a light plastic sleeve. But then there were some cards that were in like a hard plastic sleeve. And then there were some cards, these were often like had a signature on them or something like that, that were in and like an acrylic two-piece case that had screws at the four corners. And often those were attached to some sort of wood plaque with a little brass nameplate underneath and often placed on like a shelf or, or the, the, uh, hung on the wall or whatever. And those cards you did not touch. Why? Because they were valuable. They weren't like mine. It wasn't, you know, like you would thumb through and you would have, you know, copies of, uh, you know, multiples of a card or, or, or whatever, and you would do like some trading on the playground, you know, behind the monkey bars. It wasn't those kinds of cards. These were, these were rare. They were, they were, there was something special. There was something unique about them, and they were valuable. And, and because of their value, they were given a special place of honor. On the wall, on the shelf, behind acrylic, you can look, but you cannot touch. An honor defined is, it's the bestowal of value or worth. It means to hold something in high respect or to revere. And so when we talk about the word honor, think prized possession. Maybe for some of you, when you think of a prized possession, you think of a special rookie card that you had from your baseball collection, baseball card collection when you were a kid. Or, or maybe you're one of those people that have the, the number one issue of some comic book, and it's in a plastic sleeve, you know, and, and it's, never, uh, it's never experienced like the actual air of, of the universe has never even gotten on it. Like, you've never thumbed through the pages. You've only looked at the cover through that plastic sleeve. Or perhaps it's a special trophy or award that you were given once upon a time that sits on your dresser or on the shelf. Maybe it's a piece of jewelry. Maybe it's your wedding band or your engagement ring or something that was given to you by someone very special. Perhaps it's a family heirloom of some sort. And, and because we value these things, we, we encase them in plastic or we put them on a top shelf or some other prominent area where they can be admired. Or we tuck them away in a safe or, or even take them to the bank and put them in a safety deposit box. I've even heard of some high-end art collectors of which I know absolutely nothing about, but some high-end art collectors that will buy a piece of very rare art for an ungodly amount of money, and then they will commission a copy to be made of it, and they hang the copy on the wall in their living room or in their gallery, and the real one is actually tucked away under lock and key because it is so valuable. It's too valuable to even be displayed on the wall. And many of us, we don't think twice when it comes to ascribing that type of value to some inanimate object that we hold dear. Yet, we often fail to hold living, breathing humans with the same esteem. And that's problematic. So today we're going to talk about that. Because we're in part three of a series called DNA, where we're taking a look at the core values of Christ Walk Church. And I believe that it's important for us to talk about these values so that we can all be on the same page in regard to the kind of church culture that we are trying to create here at Christ Walk. And then also for you to understand the expectations that are placed on you as a person who calls Christ Walk Church home. And so two weeks ago, we began our series with our first core value, Jesus is Our Message. And then last week, we talked about core value number two, people are our mission. And if you missed either of those messages, I would highly encourage you to go back to our YouTube page and watch or um, our podcast um, and, and, and listen. And while you're there, maybe you want to you like and subscribe. That would be awesome. That way you don't miss 
um, any of our future content. But we've talked about, number one, Jesus is our message. Number two, people are our mission. And now today we're going to talk about number three. Um, We're going to continue our series with the third value. Honor is our calling. Honor is is our calling. And can I just say, this is arguably, of the eight core values that we do have, this is arguably the most difficult one. It's hard. Honor is hard. We're going to find that out. We're going to find out the reason why it's hard, but we're also going to find out how, in a very relevant, in a very practical way, how we can become people of honor and the reason that we should be people of honor. And that starts in 1 Peter chapter 2. Hopefully you've turned there by now. We're going to start in verse 4 together. Peter writes, he says, You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. And what's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I'm placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor. And anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Verse 7, yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But, verse 9, you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. Say chosen. Chosen. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you, say called. He called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. Verse 11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior. And they will give honor to God when he judges the world. For the Lord's sake... Submit to all human authority, whether the king is head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slave. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Then Peter closes out this passage with verse 17. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. Now, I I think it's interesting and kind of the bulk of this passage, there's really kind of two um, main ideas that I would pull from there. There's a lot that we could dig into, but um, just at kind of a 30,000 foot view of that particular passage of scripture is that first of all, we have been honored. We are an honored people. It says in verse nine, you said it, the word chosen. It says, for you are a chosen people. God has bestowed value on us as his chosen people. It says that we are his, his very own possession, that he values us. And in fact, because of his value, because of the value that he's placed on us, that's why he sent Jesus to the, to the world in the first place, so that he would pay the penalty of our sin and, and take death upon the cross, death that we deserved. He did that because he valued us. And as a result of the value that he has placed on us, we have been set apart for a special purpose. We've been chosen. In in Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, the author writes, What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that, that you should care for them. 
He's talking to God. He says, yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. We have been honored by our heavenly father. He has chosen us. The second main idea of this passage is that not only have we been honored, but we are to honor. We have been honored and we are also to honor. It says in verse 9, also, not only were we chosen, but we were called. We were called. He says, Peter writes, he says, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We've been called to live differently than the world around us. And in case you haven't noticed, the world in which we live is not a world of honor. It is a world of selfishness. It is a world of me, of I, of my way, of get out of my way, of me first. It is not a place of honor. And the world will beat you up and it will put you in your place every step of the way. But, but Peter says, but you, talking to believers, talking for those that have placed their, their hope and trust in Jesus Christ, talking about the church, he says, but you are not like that. Because you have not only been chosen, but you've been called to step out of the darkness the way the world lives and step into his marvelous light. And as we step into his marvelous light, what we discover is that that we have been called, we've been given a mission to fulfill with our lives. Last week, we talked about that mission, people, our, our mission. And you will note as we go forward that a lot or the majority of these values, they all overlap in different areas with one another. And if you and I, if we are going to fulfill the calling, the mission that has been placed on our lives to step out of darkness into his glorious light and and to to be a people that, that reach people, that found people, find people, if we are going to be that kind of person, if we are going to fulfill that calling and that mission in our life, then honor is required. Honor is required. Not only have we we've been honored, but we have been called to honor. It is a requirement for us to fulfill the calling, the mission that has been placed on us by God himself. Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 10, he says, Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. Take delight in it. That, that like Chick-fil-A, as they would say, it's our pleasure. We take delight in it. We stop at nothing to do it. It is, it's who we are. Yes, we are choosing to honor. We, we, are enjoy, we are not honoring other people with gritted teeth, mumbling under our breath. We are honoring people because it is our joy to do so. Because as we do that, we are fulfilling God's call in our life. Because not only have we been honored, we have been called to be people of honor. And so if I could sum up this entire passage that we just read in in 1 Peter 2, I I would do it this way. I, I would say that basically what Peter is saying is that those who honor God will be honored because it starts there. It starts with with us honoring God and, and we can't miss that part of it. It's impossible for us to honor other people if we are not honoring God first. It's impossible for us to be honored if we are not honoring God first with our lives. So those who honor God will be honored and those who are honored should show honor toward others. It's a whole lot of honor going on right there. Let me say it one more time. Those who honor God will be honored and those who are honored should show honor toward others. And when we think of honor, maybe you think of like a military officer in his dress uniform with having a, uh, someone else pin a medal on his shoulder. Maybe you think of a judge with a gavel, a long black robe. I don't know, maybe it's Judge Wapner for a certain age group. Maybe it's Judge Joe Brown for another age group. Maybe it's Judge Judy for another age group. Maybe you think, when you think of honor, maybe you think of Hail to the Chief being played as the president of the United States boards Air Force One. Maybe 
You think of a member of the British monarchy and all the drama that surrounds all of that. Maybe you think of a celebrity walking a red carpet. Or perhaps you envision an actor receiving an Oscar or a singer, musician receiving a Grammy. But whatever we think of, honor is so much more than that. Despite the the picture that we have in our mind when we think of the word honor and, and what that looks like to us, across the board, honor, regardless of how we look at it, it has, uh, it, it has its roots in one common place. Its roots are found in the place of humility. In the place of humility. And, and it, honor is, is as much of a mindset as it is something that we take action upon. It's, it's not just something that we do, it's something that we think, it's something that we are. And, and honor throughout scripture is directly linked to humility. That those, those two things, they are connected together. You cannot be a person of honor if you are also not a person of humility. For example, Proverbs 18, 12 Haughtiness goes before destruction, but humility precedes honor. Proverbs 15, 33, fear of the Lord teaches wisdom, but humility precedes honor. He says it again. Proverbs 22, 4, true humility and fear of the Lord lead to riches, honor, and long life. That sounds pretty good. I'd like to have those three things. It says true humility and fear of the Lord lead to that. Come to the New Testament. James 4 verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. There it is again. We humble first, we, we act on humility first, and then we are honored. Humility precedes honor. Proverbs 22, or 25 verse 27 says, it's not good to eat too much honey. And it's not good to seek honors for yourself because that wouldn't be humble. If you're seeking honors for yourself, that's not acting in humility. And so it's important for us to understand that that we don't honor others in order to gain honor for ourselves. Rather, we honor others because God has honored us. It is out of the honor that he has bestowed upon us as his children that we are able to honor other people. It has nothing to do with anything that we have done or that we have gained or, or any benefit that we can bring. It's all out of the honor that he has given us that then we are able to extend that honor to the world around us. And so for the next few minutes today, I want to answer three questions in regard to fulfilling the call of honor on our lives. Three questions in regard to fulfilling the call of honor in our lives. If you're taking notes, maybe you want to write these down. The first question that we would ask or that needs to be answered, I think, so that we're all on the same page about honor is, is, well, who do we honor? Who out there is worthy of receiving our honor? And and here, we we like to say it this way. We honor up, down, and sideways. We honor up, down, and sideways. And so what that means is is that, that when we honor up, it means that we honor authority. We honor the authority figures that are in our lives. And that starts with, um, and, and I can't think of a better place to start actually here on this Mother's Day than, than the biological authority that, that's been placed in our lives. Our parents. The Bible says it this way. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, verses 1 and 2, I can remember laying my hands on um, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's pregnant belly and, and just quoting this scripture over and over and over. I think we quoted it a little bit more for Luke than we did Avery, maybe. It says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. You need a reason, kids? It's because it's the right thing to do. It says, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Because as long as you honor your mom and your dad, they won't want to kill you. Let me tell you how serious God takes this. 
you go back to the Old Testament, and this is one of the multiple places that it says this. In Leviticus 29, you can also find it in Exodus. Leviticus 20, verse 9, it says, Anyone who dishonors father or mother must be put to death. Such a person is guilty of a capital offense. All the kids in the room are saying, thank God we live under the new covenant. (laughs) Thank God we are in the times of the New Testament. It's clear that God takes this sort of thing seriously. All the parents of teenagers in the room are now so thankful that they know that that verse is in the Bible. And they are going to use it with great liberality in the days and weeks ahead. We're to honor our biological authority. We're we're to honor our political authority. Presidents, governors, elected officials, even if you didn't vote for them, even if they share different views than you do, even if they're not a part of the same party that you might ascribe to, we honor those in political authority. And, and along with that, our civil authority, police and other law enforcement. We honor them because they have been placed in that position. Are there bad apples out there? Absolutely. But that doesn't give us any right to not show everyone honor because of a couple bad apples here or there. Paul writes in Romans 13, verse 7, he says, Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them, and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. That's what's required of the believer. The world is watching, and they're seeing how we are behaving. I'm not pointing fingers. But you know who you are. They're seeing how we're behaving in terms of our response to our president, to the police, to others that we come in contact with. It needs to stop because we're not being people of honor. We need to honor our biological authority, our political and civil authority. We need to honor our spiritual authority. That's our pastors, elders, our overseers. I'm not just saying this because I'm the pastor. The author of Hebrews said it in chapter 13, verse 17. He says, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. I love this next part. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. (laughs) Because that would certainly not be for your benefit. Dear Pastor Blake. Yeah, I haven't gotten one of those in a while. Probably do. Maybe after this message. Give them reason to do this with joy and not sorrow. I love being your pastor when we're all on the same page and we we all get along and when we're all moving in the the right direction together. I love being your pastor when honor is extended as honor is given. Makes it great, makes it a joy, but when that doesn't happen, it makes it pretty sorrowful sometimes. So, our biological authority, our political, our civil authority, our spiritual authority, our educational authority, teachers, principals, and the like. Exodus 22, verse 28 says, You must not dishonor God or curse any of your rulers. I'm married to a teacher. I know a lot of teachers. I know how kids treat them. Take heart. Take note, young people. They're there Because God has placed them there and he's he's positioned them there to help you. And even though um, sometimes they might make your life a little bit difficult, doesn't mean that doesn't give you reason to to dishonor them. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So that's how we honor up. We honor those that are in authority. We honor honor down and and, and, um, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. But when we're talking about honoring down, we're talking about People that are different than us, people, um, uh, the people to to whom we have been called. 
that we, we reach down because it's a, it's a humbling. Remember, it's, it's a humbling of ourselves. We, we have to stoop down to get low, to humble ourselves, to, to serve, to connect with these people. Ultimately, what we're talking about is, is people that are outside the faith. Remember, people are our mission. These, these values, they overlap. And so we, we've got to honor those that are different, that are, that are outside the faith, that, that aren't a part of the church, that Jesus is not um, their, their Lord and Savior. They haven't surrendered their lives to him. The, the people that we've been called to serve and to reach. Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes in verses 3 and 4, he says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. But be humble. There it is again. It keeps popping up all over the place. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others as well. How we honor down. And then finally, up, down, and we honor sideways. We honor sideways. This is where we honor the believers that are in the trenches alongside of us. Those that are a part of the kingdom and the family of God. Paul writes in Galatians 6 verse 10, he says, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. See, to honor someone... It's important to note, to honor someone, it doesn't mean that we have to agree with them. Talking about people in authority, it doesn't mean that we have to agree with all of these people. Those that we've been called to honor, it doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything that they do, but it does mean that we still have to treat them in a certain way or behave a certain way toward them regardless. So we need to understand that disagreement never validates dishonor nor does it require compromise in one's beliefs. For example, the Old Testament, the beginning of the book of Daniel, you've got Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego. They're taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. They didn't agree with the king. They didn't agree with what he was asking of them, yet they still honored him without following his guidelines. They separated themselves, but they still showed the king honor. See, it, it, we may not agree with the person, but we should always choose to honor their position, regardless of what it is. We honor up, we honor down, and we honor sideways. Number two, the second question, with what do we honor? With what do we honor? Well, we, we honor with our thoughts, with our words, and with our actions. We honor with our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Here's some really practical stuff. Our thoughts. How do we honor with our thoughts? We do what I like to call assume the best. We assume the best about the other person. We assume the best about their ideas, their viewpoints, about the things that they're bringing to the table. We try to see things from their perspective and their point of view and realize that we don't have to agree in order to show them honor. But we don't just immediately write somebody off because they have a different approach or a different viewpoint than we do. When somebody presents that to us, we don't, oh, that person's an idiot. No, we try to put ourselves in their shoes and see things from their point of view, from their position. Number two, our words. There's a checklist. Are your words building up or are they tearing down? The words that we share with the people around us, are they encouraging or are they demoralizing? When you speak towards those that are around you, when you speak towards those that are in authority, to your boss or, or, or to your teacher, or when you speak to those that, that are serving alongside of you, that, that are your brothers and sisters in Christ, or when you speak to those in, in the community that, that are the people that you're trying to reach, that you should be trying to reach and, and wrap your arms around them and, and welcome them into the fold of the family of God, when you speak to those people, are your words building them up? Are they lifting them up? Are they encouraging them? Or are they... Are they tearing them down? Are they demoralizing? Are they causing them pain and suffering? Ephesians 4.29 says, Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So not only do we honor people with the way that we think about them, we honor people with the way that we, uh, with the way that we speak toward them and about them. And then thirdly, with what do we honor? It, it's our actions. 
This is the way that we treat other people. The way that we behave, the, the, way that, the, the way that we interact with them, is it helpful or is it harmful? Are my actions toward my family and, and, and towards the, the people in this congregation and towards the people that I come in contact with and in my neighborhood and the community at large, are, are, they, are they helpful or harmful? Are they administering grace or are they applying condemnation? Is the way that I behave around people, is it fostering community or is it just stirring up drama? Is my actions toward other people, is it, is it celebrating them and their life or is it denigrating them and turning them to something less than they are? We honor others in word, in thought, and in action. So we've talked about who do we honor. We've talked about with what do we show honor. And then finally, number three, how do we show honor? How do we show honor? Do so in three primary ways. We show honor first through submission. Through submission. We talked about this a little bit earlier when we were talking about the way that we honor up, the way that we honor authority. We honor through submission. You have to be humble in order to submit. You have to be humble to, to, to give someone else the right of way. That's what it means to submit. And we do this both in our heads because we know that it's the right thing to do, but we also do it in our heart. We submit in our heart because we have a desire to honor others by honoring God. We have a desire to honor others by, or to, to honor God by honoring others. So first of all, we show honor through submission. Secondly, we show honor through salutation, through salutation. The things that we say about people or the things that we type about other people. We don't air our grievances on social media. Facebook doesn't need to know about how we think or feel about another person, particularly when we're tearing them down, making them out to be less than what they are. We don't get around in a circle and share a prayer request, a.k.a. gossip, about our disagreement with a spouse or a neighbor or our pastor, our employer, whatever. So we honor other people by whenever there's an issue between us and them, the only people that know about it is them and God. That's how we honor people with our salutation. That we address the issue with them and we address it with God. I'm telling you, it's hard. Because our, our inclination is to, we want to get advice and input from all over the place. Because we want other people to know the way that we've been victimized and how it's hurt us and the things that are happening to us. And it's difficult. That's not how we do it. We honor other people but when there's an issue, when there's a breakdown, we talk to them about it and we talk to God about it. Because ultimately, those are the only two people that can do anything about it anyways. So how do we honor people? We honor them through submission. We honor them through salutation. And then thirdly, we honor them through service. We're never more like Jesus than when we serve someone else. And even when people cause us harm, even when people make like life difficult, we go out of our way to find ways to serve them and put them ahead of us. Why? Because it's what Jesus did. It's the model that he left for us. And so when in doubt of how to act, just be like Jesus and everything will turn out okay. When in doubt of how we are to respond to a situation, just do what Jesus would do and everything will be okay. We show honor through submission, salutation, and service. And so if I had to, if I had to just label this like a big idea for this message or, or just like what this means in a very like a practical principle that, that we should live out, it's simply this. Honored people honor people. Honored people honor people. It's who we are. It's what we do. 
It's the calling that has been placed on our life. Imagine if we all just started to do this. If, if the group that's just gathered in this place this morning, if we all just decided that we are going to be a people of honor, that, that up, down, and sideways, in our words, in our thoughts, in our actions, through submission, through, through salutation, through service, that we're just going to be people of honor. Think of the ripple effect that would take place throughout this community and the lives that would be changed as a result and the way that people would look at not just our church but how we would be able to point them in the direction of Jesus. Because the truth of the matter is people don't live this way. The world is not that way. We've been called. We are not like that. We've been challenged to step out of darkness into his marvelous light and to fulfill the mission that God has given us. And we do so through humility and honor. That's how we make a difference in the world around us. And when it comes to us being honored first, we were honored because God sent his son Jesus to die in our place, to pay the penalty of our sin which we rightly deserve. And if you're here today, you're watching with us online, and you're not in a right relationship with your heavenly father, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus once and for all, making him Lord and Savior. If you would like to do that, I'd love to extend an opportunity to you to just pray this simple prayer with me. Can we just bow our heads in reverence can we pray together? Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I'm lost without you. I believe that Jesus died in my place, making a way for us to have a relationship. Today I choose to follow Jesus, his way, for the rest of my life. 